everyone, and welcome to my channel. This is the third video of a series called Meet the Pros. In this series, I will be interviewing people in the field of biology and genetics to help high school students interested in biology. In today's episode, I will be interviewing Dr. Peretz. She is the AP Biology teacher at the Petty School in Heightstown with a PhD in genetics from Yale University, and I'm delighted to have her with me here today. Thank you for being here, Dr. Peretz. Of course. Okay, so for some background, um, how did you first become interested in biology and cancer genetics? Um, I first became interested in biology uh, in high school, where I had a great biology teacher who um, we got to do lots of fun labs, like we did a lot of fruit fly Drosophila experiments, mm -hmm. uh, but also he started a club, a biology club, and took us to a local university where we got to visit labs and do things like dissect freshly killed chickens. Um, yeah. So we got to have experiences that were sometimes gross, but always memorable. Um, and so that's how I got into biology. And then um, when I started college, one of my uh, favorite classes was biology. And I talked to one of the teachers and I said to him, this is really kind of cool. How could I learn more? And he said, oh, you should come to my lab and help us with our research. Oh, so cool. I spent my, yeah, I spent my undergrad doing research on wild zucchini, okay. um, as opposed to the kind you might grow in your garden and specifically looking at the genetics of that. Okay. Uh, and that led me to have really cool experiences. Like I got to spend a summer in New Mexico uh, collecting bees that were pollinating wild zucchini at five in the morning out like in the deserts of New Mexico. Uh -huh. um, so yeah, so definitely, I think I had some great mentors that mm -hmm. helped me end up uh, in this field. Okay, so you have a doctorate in biology, but how did you choose, how did you choose teaching as a career over working in the industry? Yeah, so um, after college, I, I loved genetics and I was really interested in cancer. So I went and I got my PhD in cancer genetics. Um, and while I was doing that as part of grad school, oftentimes um, in science, you get paid to be in grad school, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. But in exchange, you do lab work. And also, at least at Yale, you also did some teaching. And so I started, uh, I TA the genetics class, like an undergrad genetics class, mm -hmm. and I loved the experience. And so uh, I was very lucky that the person I was doing my PhD with was supportive of this, because sometimes they just want you to you know, do your research. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but the professor I was working with was fabulous. And he said, that's awesome. Go for it. And so I kept teaching. And in fact, um, at Yale, they had a new program called Working at Teaching. Mm -hmm. And the idea was to teach people how to be good teachers, because yeah. somebody could get a PhD in something, they could, heck, they could get a Nobel Prize in something, and be teaching classes and never have taken a teaching class. Mm -hmm. um, and so our goal was to help grad students and postdocs and young professors become good teachers, not just good scientists or good researchers. Okay. Um, and I love doing that. And so when I was um, when I graduated from grad school, I knew for sure that I wanted to keep teaching and that actually I liked it even more than doing research. Um, I'd never heard of independent high schools. I definitely didn't think, oh, I'm going to go teach at a high school. Uh, but then by chance, you know, Petty advertised in the place where I was looking for university positions. And I was like, that's kind of intriguing. And I went to visit and I fell in love. So that's how I ended up teaching high school. Okay. So it's like, you just had a lot of mentors that really supported you along the way. That helped a lot. I'm a really big fan of finding mentors to support you. Yes. Um, so you did talk about um, going to New Mexico and like working in a lot of professional labs. Um, what would be your advice to high school students interested in biology? Like, what could they be doing outside of school courses? Um, maybe any books that they could read, things like that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think, you know, in some ways, high school kids right now are so lucky because you can learn as much as you want without ever leaving your house. I do think people should go outside every now okay. and then. I'm not yeah, saying yeah. spend 12 hours a day on the computer. Um, but honestly, like, you could take uh, entire Yale undergrad genetics course from your computer for free right now. Um, I'm a big fan of reading, and so I always think there's great books that you could read. Um, of course, you know, I, I run a research program. I definitely believe in students doing research, but I wouldn't want someone to ever think they were behind because they didn't get to do research in high school. Mm -hmm. It is quite unusual to get to do research in high school. I okay. think um, 
you know, when I send kids to do research in labs, my goals are for them to get to see how fun it can be in a lab mm -hmm. and also for them to get some great mentors. And I think you can get both of those later yeah. in your career. It doesn't have to be in high school. So, you know, I think sometimes people feel like, oh, if I don't have a paper published by the time I'm out of high school, yeah. Yeah. that's not true. Like you don't have to be, you don't, it's awesome if you can do research in high school. It's totally fine if you don't do research in high school. Mm -hmm. um, I do worry that sometimes people feel like I need to find a grad student to write a paper with me. I need to go volunteer internationally. I, like I need to, I need to, I need to. Mm -hmm. And I think really what you should do when you're in high school is explore stuff. Yeah. And the kids who are just driven by like, I'm curious about this and I'm curious about that. They're going to get the skills they need to be successful in college and colleges. There's there are going to be a lot of options and you're going to get to try new things that you've never even heard of. Mm -hmm. until you get to college um yeah. so you know i think the best thing to do in high school is just explore and you know read and watch videos and just start figuring out what you're curious about okay uh now i want to switch over to a couple of science related questions um so for some background info could you talk about your research um, involving breast cancer treatment sure um so to tell you the truth i ended up doing this research Again, but probably because of a mentor. So at Yale, when you start grad school, you have to rotate through three different labs. Mm -hmm. And so I went to three different professors' uh, research labs. And at the end of the day, I picked the one I picked because the person running it was fabulous. And you know, I still think he was fabulous. Yeah. Um, his research actually focuses on what they call triplex DNA, which is, you know, DNA is usually a, a helix, a duplex. Yeah. And what happens if you throw an extra strand in there? And the question of if you do that correctly, could you actually get the DNA to change? Um, but honestly, I wasn't interested in that. I wanted to do cancer yeah. genetics. And he was yeah. like, okay, come to my lab. You could do cancer genetics, uh, mm -hmm. which was awesome. So what I did was I grew human cells and I made them overexpress a receptor. So uh, you might know receptors are just proteins that hang out on the membranes of cells. And if this is a receptor, there's going to be all kinds of things going by, but there's something called a ligand, which is another protein that fits correctly into this receptor. Okay. And when the ligand binds the receptor, it starts something inside the cell. So it might tell the cell to divide. It might tell the cell to release something. It might tell the cell to die. It just depends yeah. on yeah. where you are. So what we did is we took a normal human cells and we caused them to overexpress a receptor. So normally all cells have some amount of this receptor mm -hmm. and we made them have more of it. So the receptor we looked at is called insulin-like growth factor one receptor. Mm -hmm. It's a really weird name. Like clearly someone found the insulin receptor and then someone found this one and they're like, kind of like the insulin one. We're going to call it the insulin-like growth yeah. factor one receptor. That's kind of how science works sometimes. Um, it is involved in telling the cell when to divide. So as you can imagine, having extra receptor might cause the cell to divide more often. Mm -hmm. And so that was our question. What happens if you have too much? We know it can lead to cancer, but why does it lead to cancer? Yeah. So I was looking to see when you have too much of this receptor, is it leading to cancer just because the cell divides more in regular conditions or what exactly is, is mm -hmm. going on internally? Um, because we really like to know all about these complicated pathways. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so one thing that we found was that when you expose cells to what we would call the tumor microenvironment, what it's actually like in the center of a tumor, mm -hmm. um, most cells die there because the center of a tumor, if you think about it, here's your cancer in the very inside, it's hard for nutrients to get in there. Yeah. It's hard for waste to get out of there. So it becomes really acidic. Most cells would just die. Mm -hmm. But of course, cancer cells are like, okay, most cells couldn't live here, but I can, that's yeah. the problem. So what we saw is that when you overexpress this receptor and then you put cells in um, um, the cancer-like microenvironment or when you expose them to UV or a bunch of other things, they still survived and thrived. Um, so having too much of this receptor causes cells to survive better in a tumor environment. So it basically made them tougher. In a exactly, sense. so it made them tougher. Yeah. So. <laughs> Is improving the survivability of normal cells, is that also like a big focus in cancer research? Because I feel like a lot of it is focused on getting rid of the tumors. So Yeah, so I would say you want your cells to survive as long as you're supposed to, but you also want them to die when they're supposed to. Yeah. 
Yeah. Does that make sense? And so, um, you know, most of your cells have no problem surviving. You wouldn't be here if your cells didn't survive, right? right. If you were born with a mutation where your cells didn't divide or couldn't grow, you, you really wouldn't have been born. Yeah. Um, but cancer is when cells don't stop surviving, when they don't die, when they should. Yeah. So what we really are thinking about with cancer treatment is how to stop cells from dividing when they shouldn't or mm -hmm. how to just target the cells that are overexpressing something that normal cells wouldn't overexpress. So if, you know, God forbid you have a cancer in your liver, how can I just target the cancer cells but leave the rest of your liver cells healthy? Mm -hmm. um, and as you know, you know, you can do that with surgery, but we can't do surgery in yeah. all parts of the body. You can do that with radiation, but radiation, again, not always super specific. Yeah. Yeah. And at the end of the day, cells travel, and especially cancer cells. This is a mutation that most of your cells can't just like pack up and go. Like typically your liver yeah. cell can't be like, I'm out of here. I'm going to go live in the pancreas. Um, but cancer cells can do that. They can let go and go travel around the body. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, getting radiation to your liver isn't going to do you any good if you end up moving, you know, yourself somewhere else and I'm not treating the other part of the body. Um, so yeah, I would say to me, I still think cancer treatment is super interesting. The research is so important. Uh, it's very complicated. Yeah. So going back to this insulin-like growth factor one receptor, like the um, the pathway of it, like it probably affects, I don't know, hundreds of other proteins and each of them affect many, many other proteins. And the question is, when are they turned on? How do they interact with each other? What happens when they don't interact with each other? You know, it's amazing to me that we can figure any of this stuff out, but yeah. I think slowly, slowly, we're trying to make our way there. Mm, okay. Can we like purposely overexpress that receptor? Yeah, um, you can. Okay. So yeah. how come mm -hmm. we just don't do that to like help the cells during? So the, the problem with overexpressing the receptor is that you're going to cause the cell to divide when it shouldn't. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? And if the cell is yeah. dividing when it shouldn't, that's going to be what leads to it being cancerous. Okay. But does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I thought so the the receptor, when that's overexpressed, then the cells are able to survive in the Yes. Okay. They can survive, but part of surviving is not dying when we want them to die. Does oh, that make sense? So it's like, okay, uh, I get it. I get yeah, it. I know, I know. The whole thing is so complicated. It's, that's exactly right. Like, cancer is not a problem because it kills your other cells. Mm -hmm. It's a problem because it steals nutrients from your other yeah. cells. And you don't want to make your other cells super cells because the super cells, that's really what's making a cancer to begin with. So it's like a balance that you have to maintain? Very much so. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I guess another good question is like, could we figure out how to cause cells that are overexpressing the receptor to underexpress it or to stop yeah. Like really you want all of your cells to like express exactly the right amount. Like this is the right level, right? We mm -hmm. know too much causes cancer. Mm -hmm. For some things not enough, like those cells are gonna die and that's not a healthy way to go either, right? So how do we get all cells to express exactly the right amount of hundreds of receptors? Yeah, That's the complicated part. So then on the general level, can we control expression of a gene at all or? That's a great question. Um, in the lab, sure. Super mm -hmm. easy in yeah, the lab. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in a person, I mean, your body tries to, that's what your whole endocrine system is about. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, it's really complicated. For example, if somebody is born without a, a receptor to try to get that, you know, this gene that we want them to express to get the actual DNA into all of their cells. Like think about how many cells a person has. And then to insert the gene, not just somewhere in their DNA, but at the right place. Because once you have a gene, you still need to turn it on at the right time. Mm -hmm. um, so you can put a, a gene in a cell fairly easily, like a virus will happily put DNA in all your cells. Mm -hmm. But what if it puts it in the middle of another gene that's really important? So now you don't have that gene. Yeah. Or what if it puts it into what we call your like junk DNA and it never gets turned on? Okay. Having it but not expressing it isn't yeah that helpful either. So yeah, Rishi, you're totally right. Like, it would be amazing if we could figure out a way to do that. Yeah. It, there's a lot of people doing research on that right now. Okay. Uh, so finally, I want to end with a fun question. 
if you could bring back any extinct species, which one would you bring back and why? And you also cannot say dinosaurs. <laughs> mm, okay, I love this question. Um, you know, it's a really hard question because what 99% of all species ever on earth are gone extinct. Like mm -hmm. we don't, I personally don't know about 98.99 of them, yeah. right? Like, and honestly, there might be like one bacteria out there that's super important, but I wouldn't know because as humans, we like to focus on big things. Um, we don't always focus on tiny little things. Mm -hmm. um, I also think we have, this is, a, this is a fun question. Like, am I bringing it back all over the world? Cause like, I think the giant sloth was awesome but I'm not sure I want to find one in my neighborhood. Uh -huh. Right, so I think you have to be a little thoughtful about like, do I really want to bring back some things that I think are cool? Yeah. Um, I can think of a lot of organisms that have gone extinct that, you know, I would like to see. Um, but right now, this isn't even a species. There was a, a giant Galapagos tortoise called Lonesome George. He, he okay. is a turtle. He was a turtle. He just passed away about 10 years ago. Okay. And um, I think he was pretty famous because he was the very last one of his species. And they, they tried to, they found him in like 1970. They kept him in captivity till he died. So he lived about 40 years in captivity. Before that, he lived like 60 years out in the wild. Yeah. They kept trying to get him to mate with other tortoises and he would mate, but the eggs weren't fertile because he was he was part of a species that he was the only one of. So, um, you know, there are other Galapagos tortoises, but I just felt kind of bad for Lonesome George. So I guess I would say let's bring back the species that he was part of and maybe while we're at it, move back in time and, you know, have him be able to stay yeah. alive and uh, mm. enjoy not being the only part of his species. Mm. Um, he, I think, is symbolic of the way humans cause things to go extinct like he was quite happy living on his island we brought goats into the galapagos they're an invasive species they ate all the vegetation so his he went extinct right him and all of his subspecies went extinct mm -hmm. um so i think he's he's a good lesson for us and like sometimes we, we make little choices that we're like oh yeah it'd be awesome to have goats on my farm and then that ends up causing uh, a really big impact on a species or in the case of the goats on multiple species. Um, does that sound like a fair answer? No, it definitely is. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think that's all we have time for today. I really enjoyed this though. Thank you, Dr. Fritz, for the interview. Oh, it was so nice seeing you. Um, I hope you have a really fabulous rest of your day and stay in touch.